Welcome back to Robin Minds. I have you with me, a special guest. Uh, if you've ever heard of Enough is Enough Nigeria, yes, I have here the executive director of the organization, and they're celebrating their fifth year anniversary. It's been five Ooh, years. Yes, it's it been has. five years. And um, for a lot of people who hear this name, they don't necessarily know um, why it is about. So let's just give them a very, very, very quick story of how Enough is Enough Nigeria came about in the first place from the protest. <laughs> well, it came about because we wanted rule of law. We want Mr. President to be made um, acting president, which is kind of funny because now everybody says we're anti Mr. Mr. President. But yeah, he actually started because we went on the streets. And not just for him, really, but it was a big part of it. At the time, um, President Yadua was sick and out of the country. And there was the whole doctrine of necessity that eventually came about that made him acting president. Um, there was a lot of violence in, in Joss at the time, and there was full scarcity. Um, and Trude Dijonga wrote an email to a bunch of people, basically, and the title of the email was, Where is the Outrage? And just encouraging young people that we can't continue to wait for the likes of Wale Shoyinka to hit the streets um, when there's something in the country that upsets us. That when would young people lend their voice? And they did. Are you against Mr. President? You say a lot Not of people say that. Yeah, they do. I mean, <laughs> and I think it's, it's uh, the point is, like, when you're critical of government, then people just assume you're opposition. And it's a bit unfortunate, but as one of my board members likes to say, that is the government of the day that tends to get the knocks most of the time. And it's, it's just what it is. I mean, you just spent a few minutes talking about the um, NIS murder. That's a big issue. I mean, yesterday was 11 months of the Chibok girls. That's an ongoing issue. And unfortunately, it's fortunately, unfortunately, it's, it's the government of the day that's um, yeah. at the heart of things like that. Yeah. You, I mean, Enough is Enough Nigeria as an organization has been a part of so many um, initiatives and most importantly also protests sometimes. Mm. The Akuma Nigeria was one that I know you, uh, Office of Nigeria was a big part That's of. Right, yeah. How did that come about? Because the government was, was very critical of that protest saying mm. it was sponsored yeah. by certain elements yeah. who paid money and was sharing rice, rice and, and brought artists and all of that. Yeah. So what role did you play as an Office of Nigeria? I mean, I think October was when we actually started meeting because there was a rumor that um, four prices were going to go up and just sort of thinking through what would be a response. Um, Arab Spring was on at the time, so there was a bit of uh, inspiration, I would say, from that. I think as early as October, someone had already signed up the handle Occupy Nigeria, like even three months before the protest. But I think the roles we play, I would say, were twofold. One, shaping the conversation in terms of just the facts. Yes, there are issues around the subsidy scheme that Nigeria has, but removing it just like that was not the answer. There were other ways you could deregulate the sector, information. You can't say that because people were steady and there were loopholes in the system, the, re the response to that is to cancel the subsidy, which for a lot of Nigerians was some sort of social service, if you want to call it, that they get from government just because we spend a lot of well powering everything that we do from businesses to homes. And so our role was one, shaping that conversa conversation and laying out the facts as we understood it. And then secondly, just being really active in the protest, sharing information, um, our website was, I forget the numbers, was just easily one of the most visited websites at the moment because we kept updating about all the different protests that were going on all around the country and just providing information so people could have an informed conversation about what the issues were. Now you, so you, I mean, you can't blame government sometimes when they're very critical of organizations like yours True. who almost always seem to be on the attack yeah. and also are all about protests. Are there things you do that are not protests. That are not, not, before we get to not protest, that sort of help government without necessarily being, the attack, being on the attack. Are there, are there initiatives like that? I think so. I mean, I think one of the two things that I would say is, for example, um, for the 2011 elections, we created an app called Revoda. And even though it's not directly helping government, the idea was, why don't we help um, ensure that the elections are as credible as possible? And it basically turns every voter into an observer. And so from your phone, you can record what you see. You can record the process. The INEC officials arrive on time. Did the police arrive on time? What were the results? And we're doing it again for the 2015 elections. I'll say that's one. The second one, we have a platform called Shine Your Eye. And it's basically a platform that allows citizens to understand how government is meant to work and also provide numbers and email addresses of government officials so they can actually engage in a positive way that's not necessarily attacking. I mean, if you have your senator's number and you have a concern, it is your right to pick up the phone and call them and Do ask they a pick question. Up some do. Some don't like being called, but just have to remind. That's the whole essence of public service. Yeah, yeah. Um, but some are quite, I mean, Abike Dabri, for example, from Lagos is, is one that's pretty good about responding, responding to, a, to calls and, um, and emails. So. Let's talk a bit about Revoda, and I'm very interested yeah. in that. The elections are around, around the, corner. the corner. People keep asking me sometimes personally, what can I do on election day? Can, is, am I just going to tweet and put pictures up? Yeah. So how does Revoda work for, for the layman? Very simply, Revoda ties your polling unit to your phone number. So once you download it, you don't need to tell us where you are. We know where you are. Now, your polling unit, just to reemphasize, is not unique. 
there are at least 750 people that have the same polling unit number. So don't think with your polling unit, gonna you. somebody's going to trace you and come <laughs> and carry. It just tells you, your polling unit tells what state you're in, what local government, and what your polling unit is. And anything that you see, you can report. You can choose to report results. You can choose. So there are four main things, or three main things. Results. You can monitor the process of the elections. Basically, did INEC arrive on time? Did the police, were they nice? Were they helpful? And the third is incident reporting. Did they snatch a ballot box? Were there fighting? Was there fraud or whatever? So those three things, and you can choose to report on any one of those things. And you just send us your report just from the comfort of your phone. We aggregate, we analyze, and, and we send out reports. And it's also useful because it's tied to your polling unit. If something is happening in your, either your polling unit or your ward, we can actually send you a text message. Um, so we have that data, so we know, okay, all these people are in Lagos State, all these people are in Ikeja local government, and if there's something happening in Ikeja, for example, if we know from INEC that Ikeja's ballot papers will be 30 minutes late, we can actually send you a message and say, calm down, they're coming, it's just going to be 30 minutes late. And that, we hope, would help people feel um, more... Interesting, so that's Revoda. That's Revoda. How's it spelled? R-E-V-O-D-A. R-E-V-O-D-A. It's the first three letters of register, <laughs> Registered Voters Database. So Revoda. Great stuff. That's uh, hope, so hopefully you guys can get get on that as well. Yeah, I mean, please we, do. We want to be a part of making sure things work um, yeah. with with the elections. Yeah. And let's talk about you know credibility and enough is enough Nigeria. I find that I don't know if it's with our generation or with Nigerians or humans generally. Mm. People tend to be very cautious of not for profit organizations because they're like, who's really sponsoring, sponsoring you? Yeah. Who's really backing you? When you attack the government too much, they say, ah, the opposition is behind you or some international organization who doesn't like the government in power. So who backs Enough is Enough Nigeria? Is there any money back behind what you do? I wish. It would make my <laughs> life so much easier. It really would. But really, for the most part, we're funded by international donors. I mean, for me, and that's a bit unfortunate, because at the heart of it, the whole essence of Enough is Enough is to raise active citizens who pay attention to government, who pay attention to governance, who pay attention to how our commonwealth is spent, and just engage, not necessarily in a confrontational way, but from a position of understanding and then standing on your rights, that this is what is supposed to happen. Why is it not happening? Um, so unfortunately, for now, it's mostly funded by international donor agencies who fund us to do specific programs. Um, and then there are a few Nigerians who actually give from time to time. So, um, but post our five years, we're trying to build a network of partners with Nigerians who then donate maybe a thousand naira monthly or five hundred naira monthly. So one, our funding base increases, and then Nigerians feel more of an ownership of the activities that we do. Yes. Let's let's talk debates now. In 2011, I mean, Up is Enough Nigeria was a part of uh, a number of organizations that um, held the debates. Yeah. Um, in 2011, a couple of presidential aspirants didn't show up at the time, yeah. or candidates. <laughs> yeah. And I know you planned one this for this year, year mm. which you even came on the show for to for, talk yeah. about yeah. in the week before it was supposed to hold, yeah. and then it didn't hold anymore. How has that affected whatever plans you might have had for the elections? I mean, a major way, because the presidential debate was a big part of our plans. It was something that we were looking forward to. We had gotten support from channels. We had gotten support from Google, from Facebook, from Twitter. So it was meant to be huge. And unfortunately, the APC candidate has refused to participate in, in a debate, um, if despite many different conversations, challenges, call-outs, and they've just refused to participate. Um, Let me tell you why. Well, they started with the, the official response to the NEDG one. Then um, this one was supposed to be part of the um, channels and newspaper associations of Nigeria one. And they basically just said they didn't want to participate in a debate, that they wanted to do a town hall meeting. I mean, they're doing town halls already, so they don't need us to organize a town hall for them since that's what they're already doing. Um, we're in talks now. I mean, they've, the youth leaders have committed to a debate for next week, Sunday. Okay. Um, so we hope they do show up. So the youth leaders of both parties with a panel and a, and a woman from each of the parties as well joining a panel um, to talk about what their parties yeah. have. But on the state level, we're host, we've supported a debate in Plateau State, and the three leading candidates showed up. Um, Rivers next week, Monday, all three leading candidates will also be participating in a debate. So not as many as we had hoped we would have this year, but we're still continuing the tradition because we think it's important to, yeah. to engage um, candidates at that level. Yeah. Yeah. I think this might be shifting you away a bit from Enough is Enough Nigeria, but I just want to talk about the APC candidates in particular because with all of this you said, it means it's not an APC policy not to have debates. APC candidates are having debates. They do. You're having youth leaders yeah. from the APC as well. Well, they've committed there. to it until they um, show up. Yeah, Robin, Robin Mines did have something of that sort as yeah. well last week. Yeah. And APC members did, did show, show up. up yeah. And I saw um, APC members on Twitter talk about very it. And we're very excited yes. with what their people did. Yeah. So what, personally, and I may be speaking as Yemi, mm. what do you think the problem is? 
It's funny because it's actually in two, in two really key situations. Because in Lagos as well, the APC candidate does not want to debate either. So, and it's funny because Tunde Fashola did make a statement that anybody, I think it was speaking at uh, Mati Kuka's event, he says anyone aspiring to public office should put themselves forward for a debate. So for Tunde Fashola to say that, and the candidates in Lagos State and the presidential candidate are in a sense, refuse to participate in any debate. It's quite unfortunate. I honestly can't say that. I, I mean, obviously, there are loads of rumors, but I, I won't, I won't um, give any of them credit by <laughs> repeating them on air. But it's just really unfortunate that they're not. And especially even Lagos. Lagos has a tradition of debates that yeah. China has hosted in the past eight, uh, eight ele or four, three elections. So yeah. it's really quite unfortunate. I, I, I